Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Marsh. Uh, I'm a UK sales engineer for Zizel Networks. Uh, so thank you for joining me this afternoon. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at our ATP series. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of a live demonstration uh, where we're going to sort of log into it and go over the sort of interface and some of the features that it has. Um, so as you can currently see on screen, I've got a login screen for an ATP 800. You'll see that the uh, URL being used is zylab.zizel.eu. This is a uh, ATP which is live in our German network uh, and can be used for sort of demonstration. Um, so if you've got a pen handy, the username for it is demo and the password is demo user. It's a limited administrator, but it'll allow you to log into the device and actually navigate through the interface and just sort of familiarize yourself where everything is located. So for the purpose of this webinar, I am going to use one which I do have full administrative rights, so I don't come across any issues uh, trying to access certain features. So once you log in, the first page that you'll be presented with is the general screen. So this will give you general information about the unit. Um, you'll see that the layout is very similar to the uh, USG. Uh, so it'll show you the CPU usage, the memory usage, and the flash usage. It'll also show you how many active um, connections, how many active sessions you've got. Uh, and it'll show you things like your DHCP table, how many logged in users you've got, et cetera, and then the VPN statuses. Now you'll see it'll tell you what sort of firmware version you're on at this point. Um, and the MAC address range, serial number, and the current date and time, and then it'll give you like a, a brief overview of the top five logs that you've recently had. One of the good things is uh, that I find with uh, security devices is that you do have a quite a nice interface at the top where you can have a look at uh, exactly what's plugged in, and you can also flip it around and have a look at the back port as well. So it's very sort of visually rich, and it really does help know what's plugged in and that it's all modulating correctly. So this is the general tab and if, next to this you'll see advanced threat protection. So this is specific to the ATP range. So this is for the more advanced features for like the botnet filter and the sandboxing. So if you go to the advanced threat protection, you'll see it gives you a, an overview of um, the statistics. So it'll show you how many connections have been scanned. It'll show you botnet filters and how many have been uh, scanned with that, as well as how, how many have been sent to the sandboxing environment for interrogation. Again, with the anti-malware and the IDP as well. So you can you can also see it'll tell you the top five applications that's uh, being used, uh, the reputation filter, so how many botnets you've got, and it'll if you hover over it as well, it'll also show you the ge geographic location uh, in terms of country that it's from, so United States on there, and then on the IP reputation, you'll see that there's obviously different countries listed on there. When it comes to the sandbox inside of things, it will show you what files it has scanned and deemed as a high risk or a moderate risk. So this is just, as I say, it's just a quick overview of what it's showing you in regards to the ATP features. Uh, it is a very similar uh, layout to uh, the USGs and the VPN range. So down the left-hand side, you've got all your options. You've got your quick setup. So that's where you would set up any WAN interfaces or any VPN setups. Uh, the VPN setup, the wizard does make it a lot easier as well. And then you'll have the monitor section down the left hand side, the third one down. So this is where you can literally monitor everything to do with the device, the wireless, the VPN. Um, and again, it is exactly the same as a USG apart from the additional bits it's got, such as um, uh, the sandboxing uh, element of it. So you can see on the security statistics, if you've got it to uh, tick collect statistics, uh, which by default is switched on. So if you do want to start collecting these sort of statistics, make sure you, when you set it up, you go into this section and you do actually enable it. But you'll actually find that it shows you um, uh, how much data and how many uh, uh, match connections you've got for the specific applications. So you'll see certain things like Facebook, Windows Marketplace, BitTorrent, etc. LinkedIn so it's it's quite good in what it actually provides you and it will provide you multiple pages as well uh, content filtering um, so if, if you do collect it, it does, just gives you a quick overview um, an account of how many blocked one and pass sort of web pages you've got on the content filtering side of things so again it doesn't really show you too much information but it's good to know that the information's there if you do require it so on the anti-malware, you can see anything which has potentially uh, been blocked and what the hash value is, how many times it's actually occurred. Uh, and at this point as well, you can also specify whether or not you want to whitelist it. So you'll see that there's a malicious virus which has uh, been detected and it's been detected by the threat intelligent machine learning, which is part of the ATP uh, feature 
um, feature rich uh, settings on there and the cloud query as well. So on the reputation filter, this is uh, quite good because as you can see, the threat category is down uh, the right hand side here. You'll see that it's got botnets, phishing, etc., and what the threat level is. And it also tells you what the malicious IP address is, so where it's come from. And then it will also tell you who's infected or who the victim was. So this is quite good, especially if someone has been infected. You can narrow it down to the physical machine um, and actually start quarantine procedures. So you could um, uh, obviously you could look at blocking it on the firewall so that no data can transfer through the uh, through the actual unit. But you can actually narrow down exactly where the machine is and and then start the uh, on-premise diagnostic uh, and ensuring that you do remove any uh, any infected files. Uh, again with the IDP, so the intrusion detection and prevention. So it, it basically shows you uh, how many packets he's dropped or reset um, and uh, anybody who's potentially tried getting into your uh, unit and potentially causing it issues. So again, if you've got any sort of uh, uh, broadcast storms or anything like that, then you'll see the uh, VLC media player plugin. Um, it's actually restricted that because it was starting to hammer the unit. Um, on the sandboxing, so this will show you anything which any files which have come into your network that it doesn't recognize. So one of the differences between the ATP and the USG is that if a virus or a botnet or something has, has first ever been deployed, say today, and it, it's hit this unit as a first point of contact, because the unit doesn't recognize it from any sort of database, online database, um, or the periodic signatures which the USG would download, the ATP has a cloud learning mechanism, so it has like a, a, a cloud engine, um, which all the ATPs look to, to interrogate, it's like an online database. If the um, file has never been seen before, it will actually uh, upload like the hash values and the file to a sandboxing environment and emulate what it actually does and determine whether or not it's malicious, whether or not it's a safe file and then determine what to do with it. So you'll see on this one here, that it's picked up one suspicious file which is listed down at the bottom in the statistics and it says when it was sort of updated on there and how many occurrences it had and it also gives you the sort of file name um, you'll see that it's scanned 150 safe files so they're files which it's um, it's scanned but it's found it in its database and it's actually let it through so this particular unit is aimed towards reducing zero day threats and enhancing the security within your establishment um, so that's really it for the monitoring side of things. Obviously, you do have your logs, which are, uh, are obviously pretty good across the whole security platform. So you can narrow them down to certain elements. So if we go down, we can see that there'll be sandbox in there. And you can see that it's uh, it will show you all the files that it's scanned, where it's from, where it's going to. So it's, it's very rich in what you can get out of it. And you can email the logs as well uh, if you've got a, um, uh, an email service set up in the actual unit itself. But when it comes to actually sort of configuring it, so um, again, it is the same sort of layout as a USG. So you've got uh, all your networking elements. So you've got all your interfaces, your port configurations, um, your VLANs, your bridges, etc. The, uh, what stands aside from the rest of the unit is if you get onto the security service, you will see that there's uh, uh, the sandboxing element. So it pretty much matches what's on the monitoring side of things, but this is where you would do the configuration. So when you get to like the content filtering, for instance, you can actually create a content filtering policy. You can specify what you want it to block. So based on categories that it's already been assigned with. And you can specify what actions to do with it. So whether you block one or pass it. Um, and obviously you always would want to log it, I would think, uh, to make sure that you have um, you can interrogate anything potentially um, historically. Uh, quite good for educational purposes because you can set up a policy specific to like a VLAN. So you could actually set up a policy for students so that you can block certain things such as uh, like, like on here, you've got legal drugs, which gambling, hate intolerance are, are all blocked. Now this is key to make sure that you're safeguarding uh, students in an educational environment to make sure that they're not being able to search anything which is against the school policies and obviously um, against the safeguarding policies as well. So when it comes to the anti-malware, you can specify what sort of file. So if you're getting any emails into your uh, into your network, you can specify 
which files you actually scan. So for instance, um, if you only want to um, scan sort of X, uh, exe files, uh, zip files or anything like that, then you can just sort of double click them or you can just highlight it and click on the arrow to the side to move them to either the available file types, which means it will ignore them, or applied file types, which is where the anti and the anti malware will interrogate them specific files. And then when a particular action is matched, so if it picks up any of these in the anti malware, what do you want it to do with it? So you, you obviously want to destroy it, or you might want to, um, but you can also specify if you just want to log it or log alert it. Now the difference between log and log alert is in the uh, in the monitor and the log section that I showed you earlier. If it's log alert, it will actually log it, but it will show it in red, so it makes it easier to spot out of a uh, a, a bunch of logs if you uh, navigate through them. So for anything like that, I always flip on log alert if I'm trying to test something, um, so that it highlights and it's easier to find. So when it comes to like zip and RAR files and sort of compressed files, because they're compressed, obviously um, the unit can actually uh, try and decompress it. Um, and if it cannot decompress it, then you can just tell it to destroy it because ultimately whatever's compressed in there could be um, malicious towards your network. So in order for us to make sure that we're fully secure in your unit, you're best off destroying anything that potentially you cannot decompress. If obviously it is a file that you are looking for, then you look at going to your IT manager and you're like, this, this file keeps getting uh, blocked uh, through our network. Is there any way that you can evaluate whether or not it is a threat? And then you can use like your endpoint security and have it on a, sep uh, a separated machine just to determine if it is um, a valid file or not. And you can, you can also update your signatures as well by clicking on the link at the bottom. And it will show you what current version you've got and when the version was actually released. So on the reputation filter, uh, this is quite good. So you do have a, uh, this is the general page, uh, but you've also got a white list and a, and a um, black list. So ultimately you can actually specify an IP address within here that you want to white list or that you want to um, black list. So to stop it or to allow it through and ignore the IP reputation. So once you've enabled it, you do have an action, a threat level threshold and a log. So what you can do is you can specify that you want it to pass it or block it. And then the, thresh, uh, the threat level threshold is determined of how secure you want the IP reputation to be. So by default it's low and above, um, and then you can go to medium and above and high. So it's uh, you can stipulate the different levels of threat uh, th the th different threshold of threat levels that you want to interrogate with the IP reputation. And again, you can specify either you want to log log or log alert it. So the type of threat uh, threats which come from the internet, so you'll see you've got quite a few tick boxes. So you've got like the anonymous proxies, the negative reputation, the Tor proxies, denial of service, scanners, web attacks, exploits, and spam sources. So this just allows you to uh, allow or disallow any of the specific files and ultimately um, uh, it's very flexible to allow you to secure your network to as much as you like and then you've got your botnets and your phishing so if you don't know what like the botnets and the phishing are there are some we uh, webinars which have done previously on the ATP which goes into a little bit more detail as to what they are just to help you understand the type of threats which are actually out there as well So the sandboxing side of things, as I say, this is where a file will be uploaded to a sandboxing environment. That sandboxing environment will then evaluate if that particular file is, is damaging to your network or whether or not it's a safe file. And here you can determine what you want to do for it. So what action do you want for a malicious file if it's detected by the ATP? Do you want to allow it or do you want to destroy it? Um, and again, what would you want to do for the log? Do you want to log it or log alert it? And then for the suspicious files, what do you want to do? Destroy or allow it? I would always recommend, obviously, looking to destroy it. But again, the options are there based on your internal policies and what type of security and what level of security you're trying to get. Um, and then you can also specify what files you want to submit to the sandboxing. So you can specify that you want uh, zips, executable, so the .exe files. Uh, MS Office documents, macromedia flash data, PDFs or RTF files, you can actually stipulate which ones you actually want to be interrogated. There are certain files that people don't want 
because uh, don't want to be sandboxed because they get quite a lot of them and they, they only ever use trusted sites. So again, that's entirely up to them. So on the email security side of things, um, you can enable it and basically specify when something comes in and it's potentially a spam. Uh, you can specify certain categories against it and you can determine what you want to do with it. So what do you want to do with spam, spam emails? You want to forward it through so it actually still hits the end user's uh, mailbox. However, it will forward it and put the tag spam on the, on the sort of front of it or it'll put virus or it'll be phishing. So if somebody does open it up, they can visually see that it's been interrogated by the firewall. It has deemed it as being a potential spam email address. So it specified the tagging in there just to advise the customer. You can just forward it without the tag, which I would never recommend, or you can drop it, which again, is down to your internal policies, whether or not you do want to drop it or whether or not you don't. Um, and that's for SMTP. And uh, then you've also got the actions for POP as well. And then you can specify again, the log and log alert section of it. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of features within the uh, ATP that, that you can use. Uh, it does go above and beyond what the USG can do, definitely in, in terms of the security it can offer. The sandboxing um, environment hooks into Lastline, which is uh, one of the industry leaders and provides 100% security effectiveness. So rather than trying to develop it in-house, um, like some, some other vendors do, we leverage from the industry leaders, making sure that we are getting the most out of our security partners. So again, if we go, if we go through the logs, you can narrow it down a bit more, uh, have a look at the sandbox inside of things. Um, anti-malware, we haven't got anything in the way anti-malware at the moment. But as you can see, it's very flexible in what you can do. Uh, I find the logs really helpful for uh, helping to secure my network and ultimately unravel the potential issue as well. So, yeah, as I say, if you need access to this for the people that's recently joined while I've been conducting it, there is an ATP 800, which is uh, um, based in Germany as part of our lab um, setup. Uh, and if you use demo and demo user, so um, so user is demo, password is demo user. So by using them details, you can actually log into this unit and then you can never navigate around. You can only do certain things on it. So for instance, you can't access the wizard um, and you won't be able to sort of change any interfaces or make any changes that ultimately could compromise the network. Because again, it is, a, it is a live environment that we use for lab works. And you will also see if you go into settings and security policies. <laughs> So in the security policies here, you'll see that we've got a few test uh, devices. So we've got like a GS1350 here. Uh, and if you hover over here, you can actually see what port you're gonna use. So if you specify in the top um, URL and use port 1350, it will actually navigate you through to the, uh, the GS1350. Uh, and again, we've got like a USG2200 on there, an SBG5500, an XGS6400. All of these do have the demo and demo user active on it. Um, so you can actually have a look at them. Again, you can't make any configuration changes to it, but it will allow you to actually navigate around it and familiarize yourself with the actual layout of it. Um, one of the best things I find as well is to be able to generate questions towards a project, it's best if you understand the actual product in terms of what features it's got, what sort of layout it's got in, the, in terms of the interface and stuff like that, because as you start navigating through it, you start thinking of further questions. So if you like approach myself or Nigel, who is the Southern, uh, Southern engineer for Zizel UK, if you come to us with any potential projects or anything like that, um, understanding exactly what you're trying to get out of it. The more questions that you can provide us, the more answers we can get you, get you and the quicker we can turn around a project to make sure it's deployed in the right sort of manner. 
um, that's obviously what we're here to help you with. So if you if you do need our assistance with any end users in terms of understanding the products we do, understanding the features we offer, um, then we're always willing to do online web demonstrations, a little bit like we're doing with the webinar today. Uh, we can always come out and meet the customers. Um, and quite often I do run online demonstrations because I find it really does help um, secure a sale and help your end users understand exactly the value that Zizor can bring to you as being a, a, a partnered vendor. So having a good vendor back in when you go to a customer shows you you've got that relationship there. So if there is anything they need, if there is any issues that they've got, you've got a clear route to get the best support that you can. And that's what we what we offer here at Zizor. So we take our feedback from our customers very seriously in terms of helping to evolve our products in the right sort of area. Uh, and just being able to assist our partners in uh, in pushing the Zizel brand further out into the market because any of you that have used the product know that the build quality is really good, the support that you get from us is really good, and we're looking to try and enhance that even further. We're even open to doing uh, webinars on your behalf um, just to show that we're obviously there to support you. Um, so, I mean, at the moment um, for today's webinar, that's probably concluded in terms of the actual layout of the ATP, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions or go over any particular features on the ATP that you may have. Uh, I do have Nigel also on the line as well, um, who can assist me answering any questions. Um, so just feel free to uh, to write in the uh, the questions or the chat box, which should be located in the uh, GoToWebinar um, dashboard, which is open. I'll keep the webinar open till around 25 past just to give you time to generate any potential questions. But again, if you need anything, just uh, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, hi there, Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan's just come f uh, through a message saying that the reputation filter was causing an issue with a URL shorteners. Is there a way to whitelist from a specific source or website? So when you say a source or website, you mean a, a, a specific URL. Uh, at the moment, it appears that there's only availability for the actual um, IP address to be uh, whitelisted, but I can look into potentially looking to see if we can enhance that to include the sort of DNS entry, uh, potentially DNS wildcard as well. Um, so I can have a look at that. Um, have you raised this with the support guys at all, and have they helped you uh, resolve it, or is it something that you've just sort of switched off and uh, just sort of let it flow? And if you want, Jonathan, what I'll do is, as soon as I finish with this webinar, I'll give you a a, a call, um, and then we'll discuss it in a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, because if that is becoming a, an issue, then I want to evaluate it, and then we'll get it raised with the support campus and potentially add a sort of enhancement in there, in which we can actually uh, uh, provide you a workaround and a fix for the uh, for the issue that you've been experiencing. Um, so if you give me about five minutes, um, uh, I'll give you a call directly and we'll go through it. Um, so 
seeing as they're the only sort of questions I've had uh, from Jonathan, so thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to close down the webinar now. Um, if you do need any assistance from either myself or Nigel, we can be contacted either by emailing sales at zizel.co.uk. We're both on LinkedIn, so you can always feel free to send us a message on LinkedIn as well. Uh, and if you've had any emails from us, you'll have all our contact details in terms of our mobile numbers as well as our direct email address if you do require any support. Um, so thank you again for everyone for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of the, your day. Um, if I don't speak to you beforehand, uh, I hope you do have a good Christmas and a good New Year. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Cool. Thanks, Danny. Cheers, Nigel. Thank you.